It is with immense grief that we inform that our speaker for this edition of the Bhumandir Talk series, Dr. Shibendu Shangar Ray, is no more. We sadly lost him to the COVID-19 pandemic on May 4th, 2021. He was an outstanding Indian agricultural physicist. He was serving as the director of the Mahalanobis National Crop Forecast Center, MNCFC. He has served in various capacities in the Indian Society of Remote Sensing, ISRS. He also served as the chair of the International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, ISPRS, Working Group A-6 on Agriculture, Ecosystem and Biodiversity during 28 to 2012, and recently as the co-chair uh, of the ISPRS Working Group on 3-10 on Agriculture and Natural Ecosystems Modeling and Monitoring since 2016 for a term to end in 2022. He has contributed a lot to uh, the area of Indian agriculture and the use of various technological advances for bettering the output of Indian agriculture. His passion for the use of remote sensing for Indian agriculture is hard to miss, even in this talk. He agreed to giving this talk for IEEE GRS's Bangalore section amidst his busy schedule of field work. His talk is precious and it's worthwhile at so many different levels. And in particular, we learned about how remote sensing is crucial for something as important as crop insurance. Dr. Ray will be immensely missed. He went too soon. With a deep respect for the departed soul, we present you this talk. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is a Pumandal talk series organized by IEEE GRS's uh, Bangalore section. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Uh, Shibendu Ray, who is the director at Maha Mahala Nobis uh, National Crop Forecast Center. And he's going to talk to us about earth observation and food security, the Indian experience. So before we um, get started with the talk, I, we would like to show you what ITROPI GRSS is all about. So, uh, so I'll just share. I'll just share my screen and show a short video of the same. G. R. A. S. S. Is the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. Our mission is to build a community of researchers and practitioners by means of knowledge sharing and scientifically rigorous dissemination of the latest advancement in remote sensing. The technical committees are really meant for doing the technical outreach to other parts of the research community and industry. We want to inform our members and reach different communities via different channels like for example social media, journals and especially education. At the moment we have more than 60 chapters and 20 student branches all over the world. I love GS family very much and I'm very honored to be the member of it. Being part of GRSS allows me to be a better research and professional, improving my skills and knowledge to do a good job. Come and be part of this great family. Ciao! So uh, that was the introduction to IEEE GRSS. Now I give the stage to Mr. Navjyoti Kannan, who is, uh, who is also an IEEE GRSS Bangalore section uh, slate member to introduce a speaker of the day. Enjoy the talk for today. You can ask questions in the chat or Q&A, and we'd be happy to take them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I take this opportunity to, to say a few words about uh, Dr. Ray. Uh, Dr. Sivendra has joined the Space Application Center, ISR Ahmedabad, during 1991 as a scientist. Uh, he has received his master's degree and doctoral degree both, in, both from agricultural physics, from Indian Agricultural Research Institute, Delhi, uh, which is one of the premier research institutions in India. In ISRO, he was involved in many national level agricultural application projects using remote sensing, uh, like crop acreage and product, product, production estimation for major crops in India. 
So looking at his uh, expertise and experience, he was invited by Ministry of Agriculture and Family Welfare to establish the center called uh, Mahalana Bis National Crop Forecasting Center, that is MNCFC, uh, during 2012. So since its inception, he is uh, serving as the director there of uh, MNCFC. His team has uh, around 50 scientific and technical staff. Uh, those who are involved in operationalization of remote sensing applications in agriculture in various uh, disciplines like you know, crop forecasting, drought assessment, crop insurance, agricultural development, etc. He has more than 200 publications, including 74 peer-reviewed journal papers to his credit. So in his career path, uh, he has been served with a number of awards. So I can name a few like ISRO Merit Award in 2014, Sadis Dhawan Award of Indian Society of Remote Sensing in 2014, National Geomatics Award of Indian Society of Geomatics in 2015, and Professor P.R. Pishorati Memorial Award of ISRS in 2005, then Dr. Vikram Sarabhai Research Award of Physical Research Laboratory, ISRO in 2005, and he has been uh, the fellow of ISRS since 2016. So we are very fortunate to have Dr. Ray with us uh, to deliver a talk on earth observation and uh, food security and Indian experience. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Ray, you may please take over. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nagjyoti. Thank you, Madam Jaya and all the participants in this uh, lecture. It's a great opportunity for me to talk about uh, what we are doing and what India is doing in agriculture and food security uh, arena um, uh, using satellite remote sensing or earth observation. So um, uh, without making, and I also am very uh, thankful to IEEE uh, Bangalore, GRSS Bangalore chapter for giving me this opportunity. I have seen, I was seeing some of your um, old lectures, very illustrated persons uh, given this lecture. So it's a, it's a kind of an honor for me to deliver this lecture. Without much delay, I will try to uh, start my lecture. So uh, I will be speaking about earth observation and food security. In other words, I'll be talking about remote sensing and agriculture, um, uh, the Indian experience. Uh, as I've already been told that I belong to Mahalanobis National Crop Forecast Center. Also additionally, um, I'm, from the very beginning, I also am a, a part of a Space Application Center, ISRO. Um, and a little bit about our center, Mahalanobis National Crop Focus Center. The center was established on 23rd April 2012 under Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. It's named after great Indian statis statistician, Prasant Chandra Mahalanobis. He was a great statistician. He was a planner, done a lot of work in the field of uh, sample survey. Uh, he, uh, technical and human resources support from Indian Space Research Organization. The mandate of the center is all operational applications using space and geospatial technology for agriculture assessment. We run various major national level programs like Fasal, Nadans, Chaman, Kishan, Crop Intensification. And I'll be speaking about some of these in my uh, consequent slide. And we have more than 100 partner organizations. In fact, more, since we are an operational organization, most of the state government, state agriculture departments, state remote sensing centers, ISRO centers, ICR centers, IMD, uh, state agriculture universities are our partners. Coming to uh, content of this presentation, I'll be talking about um, I'll be talking about the agriculture situation in the country, the Indian Earth Observation Program, information available from Earth Observation satellites for agriculture, and Earth Observation applications in agriculture. As you are aware, um, the agriculture and food and agri-tech is a um, five trillion euro global industry. And agriculture is, um, uh, is land currently used for agriculture is 38% of the total global land area. And 70% of water uh, we draw uh, currently is used for agriculture. That shows how large, how big the agriculture is in, in globally also. Coming to India, um, uh, we have a very large uh, net zone area out of 327 million hectare of our total uh, geographical area. The net zone area is 139 million hectare, nearly 140 million hectare, and uh, which is 43% percent of the total geographical area. We have food grain production recently touched 300, uh, uh, over to 300 million ton. 300, this, this year it was three, uh, the second advance estimate says it's 303 million ton. 
horticulture production is again higher than that 326 million ton irrigated area is very large but it is only 47.2% uh, 66 million hectare of irrigated area Agri though agriculture and allied sector contribute only 14.6% of the gdp uh, the highest being services followed by industry uh, but the major thing of about agriculture in india is it provides employment opportunity to more than 50% around 50.6% of the uh, population of the country so practically more than half of the working population of the country are involved in agriculture but we have our own problems and issues we have fragmented land size so the average field size is very low 1.15 hectare is only the land size especially the uh, uh, the eastern indian states so the land size is very low we are since agriculture is we are only 47.2 percent area is a um, net irrigated area we are dependent on rainfall so all rainfall related problems like droughts floods are also affecting our agriculture we have a very high yield gap oh, the, the uh, potential the yield gap basically tells, tells about the uh, difference between the potential yield and the actual yield Cropping intensity is uh, very low. It is only 139%. That shows basically 39% of the area is double crop. Uh, rest of the area, rest of other area is only monocrop, especially the Eastern Indian states. You have most of the largest tract of area is remains fallow after the Kharif. And name any disaster, it affects agriculture. Flood, drought, hailstorm, pest disease, climate change, all affects agriculture. We have limited infrastructure, the infrastructure related to cold storages, the markets, uh, they, they are limited. So all these hamper our agriculture and that's why we have uh, various issues. If you see the food grain production of the country and if you compare state-wise, there are high areas in uh, Uttar Pradesh, uh, 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 high agriculture areas in Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, but our production is high in Punjab, Haryana, UP, as, uh, because, because of the high productivity in Punjab and Haryana. And productivity is practically very low in Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Karnataka, um, uh, but it is very high in uh, uh, Punjab, Haryana. Also, it is moderately high in Telangana, uh, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, Kerala. So, this basically shows how diverse uh, state to state there is a lot of differences. And state to state, there are a lot of difference in area, a lot of difference in production, a lot of difference in productivity. Coming to state of Indian farmers, there are total agriculture workers is 263 million, uh, which is 45 out of his 45 percent cultivators and 56 percent agriculture laborers. Agriculture laborers. So practically um, around more than 25 percent of the or more than 23 24 percent of the total population of the country is uh, uh, ag um, uh, our agriculture workers number of operational holdings are 146 million uh, and among the agriculture uh, farmers small and marginal account for 86 percent and semi uh, medium and medium are 13 percent and large farmers are 0 0.6 percent so that shows uh, uh, the very large extent of small and marginal farmers, uh, that is a major problem. And average monthly income per agriculture household is 6,426, and average monthly and, uh, expenditure is 6,223. Just, uh, uh, you can see just 200 rupees extra is the income uh, compared to expenditure. 52% of agriculture households are indebted, and average outstanding loan for agriculture household is uh, 47,000 rupees. And also, um, uh, uh, though Government of India may, and the ICR, Ministry of Agriculture, is trying for um, um, farming systems, that is a combination of uh, la large types of um, uh, 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 activities like uh, um, poultry, beekeeping, all that sort of, but cultivation is still the major source of agriculture income. 63% for, for 4% comes from cultivation. So this shows the uh, status of farmers of India and government of India has a um, very uh, strong goal of doubling farmers income. Uh, this, there was seven point agenda to for um, um, doubling farmers income. This agenda starts with emphasis on irrigation with, uh, um, uh, with end to end solution and creation of resources for more crop, for drop. 
provision of quality seeds and nutrients to the uh, according to the soil quality of each farm that is why we have uh, a big program called soil health health card more than 10 crores of uh, soil health cards have been distributed to the farmers large investments in warehouses i had told in the beginning that the poor infrastructure so large investments in warehouses and cold chains should be there to prevent post harvest losses there is a uh, we need to have promotion of value addition through food, food processing because only directly um, uh, pro food products may not be used so may not uh, bring the uh, uh, income higher implementation of national agriculture that is e e nam uh, agriculture markets e uh, and e platforms to eliminate shortcomings of uh, the 548 centers um, and to mitigate the risk introduction of crop insurance scheme at a lower cost we have a very a large flagship crop insurance scheme i'll be talking about how yeah, arthur jason is helping that um, uh, which have, uh, that is pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana and promotion of allied activities as i have shown in the beginning uh, in in the previous slide that more than 63% is uh, uh, income of farmers is coming from uh, cultivation but government is proposed uh, promoting allied activities such as dairy animal husbandry poultry bee keeping horticulture and fisheries now how why eo data why you, you this is this must be known to most of the people but i thought uh, let me tell this uh, eo means remote sensing data or of just satellite based remote sensing data why eo data is used for agriculture because you get free and open data after uh, sentinel and landsat have made it free so you get very high resolution satellite data free of cost both optical and micro Uh, there is uh, you get data in any scale you get the data high resolution um, uh, low resolution moderate resolution and coverage is large uh, you can have, uh, you can have a national coverage you can have a globe uh, so if you have very high resolution you can have a taluk or district level coverage and there is consistency because the same satellite data you are using from years together so you can have a consistency of data and you, you can compare your the, you can compare the data with previous year or two, three years down the line you can compare and since we have satellites uh, in from uh, early 70s yeah uh, arthur johnson satellites from early 70s we have a long time series of data so you can do lot of long term studies a lot of studies related to climate change in the impact on agriculture how agriculture is behaving in a a long term um, uh, in long term is uh, more and since uh, this data gives us a statistics and there is lot of validation of this data so traditional this is a this is a lot of complementary to with traditional statistical methods it basically improves the traditional statistical methods you can use uh, satellite data along with traditional statistical methods like surveying um, or doing crop cutting experiments and and uh, then 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 use satellite data to either extrapolate interpolate and get a better a, a, a better uh, uh, information and you get diverse measurements from satellite data you get um, reflectance you get vegetation index you get uh, um, uh, back scatter coefficients you get um, uh, thermal um, um, information so diverse measurements you, you get from agriculture from satellite and that is helpful in Um, um, various agriculture assessment coming to evaluation of indian earth observation satellite uh, system we started in uh, early late 70s in early 90s with vaskara one and two sat uh, one and two uh, experimental satellites but real remote sensing satellites started with irs 1a in 1988 and we had lis1 and lis2 cameras but another major change uh, happened when irs 1c was launched 1995 in fact uh, recently we uh, celebrated silver jubilee in irs 1c uh, where we got a camera called wide field sensor 188 meter that gave us five day repeatability data and we also got lis 3 23 meter so these two really changed the arena and these two cameras were so good of course wifs have got uh, latrans uh, in resource sat 1 and 2 wifs was uh, uh, Um, changed to advanced wide field sensor with 56 meter resolution and uh, uh, then lis3 continued with a 23 meter resolution so these two sensors um, um, uh, really helped um, uh, the way we looked at agriculture you can recently in uh, january issue of journal of indian society of remote sensing there is a special issue 
on IRS one C. I would like you to uh, refer to that um, uh, special issue and get the various applications, various newer applications which could be uh, carried out due to uh, launching of IRS one C in 1995. But another uh, major change started with the resource search satellites, with which has got list three. 23 meter, list for 5.8 meter, and a advanced wide field sensor, 56 meter, for all multispectral data. Of course, we have other satellites for ocean observation. We started with IRS P3, then OceanSat 1 and 2, SARL, and recently we had in 2016, we launched SATSAT, uh, which is a scattermeter satellite, KU band scattermeter. Of course, this is also being used. We have used it for uh, agriculture applications for like phenology studying, crop yield estimation. We have atmospheric observations through insert satellites, megatropics, and insert 3D or 3DR, which has got sounders and imagers, which are very useful for getting all weather observations. And uh, of course, we have high resolution stereo capability data. Um, uh, the Katosat uh, 3 has um, uh, multispectral one meter and, uh, um, uh, and panchromatic, uh, um, and the Katosat uh, 2 series has now panchromatic of 0.25 meter. And we also have various uh, hyperspectral satellites, IMS-1 and IMS-2. Of course, mostly those are um, nano satellites and um, um, uh, Indian mini satellite, practically. And uh, those have uh, uh, those are mostly experimental satellites. We don't have it till now an operational hyperspectral satellite. We're going to have a, a very uh, a big development when we have a, we are going to launch GISAT, which will be on a geostationary platform giving around 40 to 40 to 45 to 50 meter resolution data that is uh, that will really change the way we look into agriculture the major work has for your satellite is uh, a resource are two and currently we have resource are two and two year both so which has got a AIPS camera advanced wide field sensor which you use uh, and 56 meter resolution with five day repetitivity which you use uh, uh, when we have a two day uh, two satellites that, that makes uh, it uh, every three day we get a data. And this is useful for the state level assessments, national level assessments, uh, uh, and regional level assessment. Then we have list three 24 meter with two satellites, it becomes 12 days. And we use it for district level assessments, then list four six meter or 5.8 meter, uh, 48 day repeatability. But with um, um, two satellites, it becomes 24 days. This is generally used for uh, cadastral applications or village level applications, uh, crop insurance program, all these applications. So these three are major workhouse which you use for agriculture applications. Of course, this is a picture of All India List 3 mosaic. Uh, those who have uh, little access to remote sensing images, you can see this is a false color composite with all red colors or vegetation. This is a picture of during February month, you can see most of the endogenetic plains are uh, uh, red, so the crop is there, but most of the, the um, central India, like Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, parts of Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, and parts of Karnataka, they're mostly uh, fellow areas. Even Gujarat also large extent is fellow areas. Now coming to uh, um, uh, international images, I was telling you that uh, uh, Sentinel-1A and 2A have uh, Sentinel-1 and 2, uh, they have Sentinel and Wall is SAR data, which is 20 meter resolution, and two is uh, uh, um, optical data with 10 meter resolution. Those are free data available. We also use Landsat data, which is a, uh, OLI that is 30 meter resolution. And you can see the comparison between the 30, uh, 30 meter resolution and the 10 meter resolution, how clear these images are seen. Of course, we have in, in India, we have list for six meter resolution, which is much better resolution these days. And this, uh, you know, India launched uh, 100 satellites together. Those are called small, small satellites called DOBS. Those are planet labs, which claims to give three meter resolution data any part of the world uh, every alternate day. But considering India has a, um, uh, the whole monsoon period is cloud covered. So still we don't get planet lab data, free uh, cloud free planet lab data. Now, if you compare Sentinel data with a combination of LISP4 and Katosat, you can see Sentinel 2A data, 10 meter resolution, combination of uh, Katosat and LISP4, LISP4 5.8 meter, Katosat we have used 2.5 meter data, and you see how clear it is, is exactly similar. This is a oil palm plantation in West Godavari district. You can see exactly similar 
uh, is Google Earth image. Sometimes we tell that Google Earth gives very good image, but if you, our own satellite, a combination of Cartosat and LIS4, we can get uh, images as good as Google Earth. Same thing I'm uh, showing you, Landsat 8 data, LIS4 data, and combination of LIS4, uh, Cartosat plus LIS4. This is Mango Archard in Saharanpur, district of Uttar Pradesh. You can see very detailed field-to-field uh, -field information using a combination of Cartosat and LIS4. Of course, as I mentioned, that they have, uh, uh, during um, Kharif season, we don't get optical data because of the cloud cover. The, uh, uh, that's why we use our uh, microwave data. We had a microwave satellite, RISAT-1, uh, which was launched in 2012. As of now, we don't have an operational microwave imaging satellite. So we are using some uh, uh, RISAT, uh, the uh, next of one, the replica of one is supposed to be launched in shortly. And so we use um, um, Sentinel-1 data. You can see Sentinel-1, the PEDI field, uh, these, all these pink colors are PEDI. Uh, this is a typical um, way because PEDI is being trans, uh, grown transplanted. And so, the, and also then the crop grows. So when you use, because of these cultural practices, because of the change in the surface pattern of the field, first flooded, rise, flooded area, then rice growing. So there is a very, Typical signature comes in SAR data. You can see all these pink areas so nicely. You can see the pedi crop. So you can uh, there is uh, so micro data SAR data we are operationally using for assessing pedi crops. Now what we get from uh, your data that is used to agriculture that is used for agriculture. First thing, simple thing that it gives you. You can see this is an FCC. All these rates are vegetation. So the images itself show that there is existence of vegetation. Suppose someone claims, some, uh, comp uh, someone takes a loan from the bank and says, I have grown crop and doesn't grow a crop. Just by seeing an image, you can know whether he has grown a crop or not. Then you put some ground truth data on that, do some classifications, and you can get a crop map and crop statistics. Here I'm showing the rice crop map and Punjab Haryana. And also then you can use some indices you can so you can make some combination of spectral reflectance by getting from the uh, near infrared and red bands and you, you combine them to get a vegetation index so this is a crop vigor map uh, of, uh, from of madhya pradesh you can see the based on ndvi and you can also since you have a multi-date data you can get the when the crop was sown when the crop was matured when the crop is maximum vegetative state the whole crop growth profile you can generate using a multi-day data. So sowing and harvesting patterns also you can identify. Uh, and I'm showing the various vegetation indices which can be taken from EO data. This is normalized difference vegetation index, which is more related to crop health. This is normalized. This is taken from our Indian satellite resource to AWIPS. This is normal difference wetness index taken from Bodhis data. This is 56 meter, this is 250 meter. And uh, then we, we, we use this for uh, um, uh, NDWA actually represents the crop water situation. Then there is a vegetation condition index. It basically compares this year's situation, this per period situation, vis-a-vis long-term situation. So you use around 25 years of data to compare the vegetation condition. And similarly, if you compare, this is vegetation condition is based on NDVI, but if you take both brightness temperature that is thermal component and the NDVI component and combine these two to get a vegetation health index. Generally, these four indices, these four indices are used in most of the applications either for yield forecasting, drought assessment, crop condition assessment, all uh, the crop health assessment, all these applications are used, uh, uh, all these applications are done using this kind of indices. We also get lot of other information from agriculture, like agrometeorological information. This is rainfall data from INSAR 3D, soil moisture from, uh, uh, from SMAP, soil moisture, uh, the NASA sensor SMAP, potential aerobic transpiration again from INSAR 3D. Then also FAPR you can get from, um, uh, from MODIS or you can get from AUS or you can get from S uh, Sentinel. So this, this is fraction absorbed power rainfall so all this agrometeorological information, which are very useful for um, uh, crop health assessment, uh, you can also get from the EO data. So this basically shows various types of information, either direct information or derived information 
you can get from EO data, which is related to agriculture, which is finally useful for assessing the food security. In India, especially since I have told in the, from the beginning that uh, um, uh, um, uh, the India is a mostly agrarian country, a lot of people are dependent on our food security, dependent of because of our agriculture. So agriculture and food security has been the major driver for Indian authorization program. Our whole, uh, uh, the birth of remote sensing in India started with coconut wilt experiment, which was done in 1959 in Kerala, where the ISRO, NASA, and uh, IC, Indian Agriculture Research Institute combined to uh, study the coconut wilt, ex root wilt experiment. The agriculture form may, uh, makes a major role in DPM Indian remote sensing satellite. The whatever satellites you are using, their sensor specifications, their spatial resolution, spectral resolution, all these are decided based on agriculture. The, because agriculture requires data every uh, every uh, now and then, every reg very regular interval. And before we you started using for agriculture, the, most of the things were done through visual interpretation. The actual growth of digital analysis of EO data started with agriculture because the agriculture depended, the crop condition depended on the actual numbers, quantitative information of reflectance values. In the country, largest number of professionals are using, uh, are working in agriculture. If you combine the ISRO, if you combine our center, if you combine the state remote sensing centers, there are a large number of professionals working in agriculture and is the biggest single user of remote sensing data. In fact, our center, though it's a very small and a new center, it's still one of the largest user of the satellite data of the country, because in agriculture, you need uh, very, uh, very frequent information. You need every um, um, week information, you need every uh, two to three days information. So that's why uh, la biggest user of that remote sensing data. And there have been large number of institutionalization has taken place, many institutes, uh, special state remote sensing center, they have a large unit of agriculture. And uh, even our center was created just to operationalize applications of remote sensing or authorization in agriculture. As I mentioned, we have a 51 hour history of using remote sensing data. Of course, I'm not using your data because uh, some of these was earlier were from, from aircraft data. So remote sensing data and crop estimation, as I mentioned in 1969, NASA, ISRO, ICR together did the coconut root study. Then in 1975, we had joint experimentation plan. A large number of experimental studies were carried out using aerial data. Uh, and, <coughs> and towards end, some satellite data. In 1988, after practically the launching of the uh, um, first IRS-1A, uh, we have a national level program called Crop Acreage and Production Estimation, where area and production estimates of major crops at state level were given. And then we started with the pilot studies because there was a requirement of giving national level estimates. So national wheat, fossil, uh, and was started, national wheat, national rice estimates. Of course, national rice was done using SAR data. And we tried one pilot study of fossil. Fossil is, uh, is a fossil, I'll explain that. It's basically, so uses multiple approaches to give multiple pre-harbor forecast. So this, uh, this was first a um, um, uh, pilot study was carried out in Odisha. And in 2007, Government of uh, India, Ministry of Agriculture approved the fossil project. With, and then we started giving district, state, national level forecast using multiple approaches and for multiple forecasts. And in 2012, uh, our center was established, uh, Mahanalamish National Crop Forecast Center, where uh, the whatever, whatever methodology had been developed by ISRO was operationalized here. So for food security, there have been large number of EO data applications in the country. Uh, the main is our major application is crop production focused, horticultural development, sustainable agriculture, which includes crop intensification, crop expansion, uh, cropping system analysis, or, or precision farming, all, all, as, uh, all applications, climate change impact assessment, disaster impact assessment, especially drought and flood, a, a, a use, use in crop insurance, based on disease forecast and based on disease impact assessment, soil resources assessment. We have a specialized institute called Soil and Land Use Survey of India, which does uh, soil resources assessment uh, using, using satellite data. Irrigation management, especially for command area, uh, command area uh, of irrigation commands. 
and uh, their, their assessment, their <coughs> performance evaluation, all these are done using agriculture data. And you know, there is a farmers, uh, India Meteorological Department in collaboration with Indian Council of Agriculture and Ministry of Agriculture provides farmers advisory, where a lot of satellite data is used to provide the farmers the information about crop situation. I'll, before I go to Indian study, I'll talk about few international programs. One global program is GeoGlam, which is, a, is the group of Earth Observation Global Agriculture Initiative. It was linked, um, um, initially launched by G20 agriculture ministers in June 2000 um, uh, in Paris. So basically, the GeoGlam um, uh, is proposed to strengthen global agriculture monitoring by improving the use of remote sensing tools for crop production projections and weather forecasting. And this initiative contributes to generating reliable, accurate, timely, and sustained, sustained crop monitoring information and yield forecast. It has got three components, um, core components, global and regional monitoring systems, national monitoring systems, and monitoring countries at risk. And there are three cross-cutting components like EO data acquisition and dissemination, R&D, and capacity development. Uh, GeoGlam, this is a crop monitor of GeoGlam which regularly monthly does crop monitor. We are, we are a, um, in, from India, Mahalanovich National Crop Focus Center is a contributor. They, uh, all this, uh, in, they do a very qualitative assessment uh, for FAO, Agriculture Market Information System, for four major crops, rice, wheat, maize, and soybean. The GeoGram has a regional monitoring system, which is SCR rice, uh, which uh, includes, which does rice monitoring of all Asian countries. Uh, both ISRO and MNCFC are contributor to this uh, SCRI's program. There is another uh, global um, uh, program called China's Crop Watch. Crop Watch uh, is the is a leading uh, the, is, uh, is leading crop monitoring system of China. It uses remote sensing and ground mesh indicators uh, for to assess rainfall anomaly, temperature anomaly, biomass patterns, and photosynthetically active radiation patterns. So that also gives a global uh, national and global crop production. And there is a, um, uh, the JRC, that is Joint Research Center of European Union, has a uh, program called Monitoring Agriculture Resources, MARS. MARS activities are agriculture monitoring, crop yield forecasting, global food security, agriculture, biodiversity, rural development, climate change, and also EO. So you can see a MARS bulletin. They, pro uh, they uh, produce every monthly bulletin for the whole of European Union and that yield forecast and area assessment they can out. And USDA, of course, has a um, USDA Foreign Agriculture Services as a crop explorer. You can see the crop uh, explorer. Uh, they also, um, they monitor, uh, that is the, basically for their own export import decisions. They monitor the crops of different countries using satellite data. You can see uh, Prova V and DBI and DBI departures. Uh, all these are monitored for India also, even at state level, they monitor. Coming to India, we have a major program for crop production forecasting, which is called FASL, Forecasting Agriculture Output Using Space, Agrometrology, and Land-Based Observations. We give multiple pre-harvest production forecasts of nine major crops using all types of satellite data, Indian and international, both optical and micro. And we can use, collect satellite, you um, use smartphones, for field data collection or ground truth collection. We generally issue around 20 forecasts in a year at national state district level. There are around 90 partner organizations. This is about a fossil. This is a typical uh, diagram, uh, approach of fossil. You can see the multiple approaches in the beginning of the season, uh, that is the prior to season or pre sowing or early season, econometry based forecasts are given. Then we use agrometrology data and uh, the field observations and moderate resolution data to give mid-season state level or pre-harvest. Uh, we are, Then we use high resolution data to give pre-harvest production forecast. And also if there is a crop damage, we give a revised forecast um, uh, after the harvest. So th this is a very comprehensive, multiple approaches, multiple institutes are involved. Like the <coughs> for econometric forecast, IEG is involved. For agrometrological forecast, uh, agrometrical estimates, IMD is involved. For remote sensing estimates, operationally it is being given by MNCFC, and the R&D activities are being carried out by um, um, Space Application Center ISRO. 
we use very as i mentioned we use various types of data for state level we use advanced white field sensor ndbi products you can see the punjab area how the um, uh, crop progression is being seen uh, april is green um, uh, rabi is still there then gets harvested then by august the kharif crop comes and uh, by september that this crop is very um, crop there is um, um, large biomass growth of crop then slowly by november that gets harvested this is the period you get uh, um, residue burning then december again rabi season starts and we use high resolution data either list 3 or landsat sentinel data for district level estimates and we use sar data for rice assessment and we use large amount of crop ground truth data uh, you these are collected through smart application uh, using an android app we also do large number of crop cutting experiments these are the experiments carried out to estimate the crop yield we conduct the crop cutting experiments we also use large amount of ground truth data for crop area assessment and we use a variety of models agrometeorological models crop simulation models remote sensing index based models semi physical models also we conduct sample crop cutting experiment for yield forecasting and from this we generate a quite a, um, apart from the statistics we generate a large number of outputs as a crop maps showing pattern maps or uh, or articles or or articles or chart maps the uh, the bigger maps all these kinds of maps are also generated apart from the statistics we have another program called chaman a uh, coordinated horticulture assessment and management using geoinformatics chaman actually uh, in hindi it's a hindi word it means a garden um, the, we under this chaman program we do area and production estimation of major horticulture crops government of india has very high emphasis on top crop that is tomato onion and potato and we also do chili mango banana citrus coriander cumin and mentha and also chaman has other programs like horticulture developmental studies Uh, using expand uh, for horticulture expansion uh, clustering and their implementation in northeastern region and other prominent states r and d studies for crop yield modeling uav applications hyperspectral remote sensing and precision farming also the examples of that this shows uh, various types of eo data being used uh, for banana chili citrus mango or onion tomato uh, assessment you can typically see uh for um, uh, orchard crops especially mango banana or citrus we use a object based classification we use a combination of um, uh, combination of cut, uh, list four and cartosat data for others we use either um, uh, sentinel data or list four data this is a very interesting study where uh, for uh, improving farmers income and uh, also uh, for food, both food and nutrient security here uh, in on the <coughs> northeastern states you have uh, you have large area which are shifting cultivation area where the uh, these are called zoom lands shifting cultivation area the farmers go, generally travels they you have the cut forest and grow crops and after some years when the uh, land becomes degraded they leave that so those abandoned zoom area are uh, government of india wants to do the Uh, horticulture expansion under mission for integrated development of horticulture so we, we use those areas from satellite data which selected those areas used various information like uh, uh, soil weather physiography uh, slope aspect all these information were used uh, to um, identify the suitable sites for growing various horticulture crops you can typically see uh, for jaintia hills district of meghalaya state these are the potential sites highly suitable sites for growing turmeric so this work was done for 28 uh, districts of eight states each district three districts uh, for crops like ericanot lemon banana kadamam dragon fruit uh, grapes kiwi uh, orange pineapple potato and turmeric so these assessments on are done and these are given to the state horticulture departments who use this for crop horticulture expansion this is us i'm showing you how uav images drone images are used for validation of that for checking whether whether those areas are really growing crops or not or uh, whether the areas which you have identified are highly suitable or whether they are actually suitable whether actually crops is being can be grown in that so those suitability are 
compared using our suitability are evaluated whatever we have suitable we have area we have given are evaluated using uav images these are other geospatial applications where your data along with various other information are used for uh, horticulture development so you can see uh, this is for bihar state cold storage planning where we use current cold storage locations the current locations of crop a crop production sites from the satellite data and then you find out whether actually the uh, existing cold storages are suitable to cater to the exact production if not how what where are the cold storage how many cold storages are needed and where those be will be um, uh, established so this kind of optimization planning is done using satellite and gis technologies eo data and gis technologies this is another interesting study where the makhana uh, uh, cultivation or fox nut cultivation which in darbhanga districts we are uh, this is generally grown in ponds so we try to identify and uh, those ponds where we can expand the makhana cultivation and find out the suitable ponds which can ex do expand cultivation this is where you use uh, in bhiwani district of haryana where you use uh, uh, multi date satellite data to find out the fallow areas and the period for which they are remaining fallow which can be uh used for horticulture uh, crop uh, in the crop intensification or expanding horticulture crops then as you are aware um, uh, many of uh, especially mango and apple orchards when they grow old they start producing uh, their, their production becomes low so that time uh, there is rejuvenation is done but to do rejuvenation you need to identify where are the old orchards so here ndvi long term ndvi data have been Uh, used to identify the old orchards disease orchards and uh, uh, healthy orchards so wh wherever there is old orchards those can be used for rejuvenation this this these are the um, de horticulture development studies uh, and your data is also used for uh, disaster assessment demise assessment loss assessment the, one of the major application is uh, drought assessment um uh, period we carry out periodic drought assessment using 17 uh, for seven, of 17 states um is uh, uh, at district sub district level as for the new drought manual government of india came out with a drought manual in 2016 and it has got various indicators including so uh, ndvi and we also do support uh, support the state governments for drought declaration and evaluate the drought memorandums various extreme weather impacts like cyclone hailstorm heavy rainfall impact Uh, may not be exactly quantitative but qualitative impact assessment uh, is carried out using um, uh, satellite data this is a flood affected area in uttar pradesh uh, similarly hailstorm affected area in uh, in uh, this uh, in the uh, whole of northwestern india or uh, biotic disasters like white fly wheat rust and locust this is a white fly attack in punjab uh, we can we can see the highly affected area um, uh, low and less affected area we trust early warning is also used uh, carried out using uh, weather data and uh, and also uh, satellite data and we also as you are aware from um, um, in punjab and haryana and parts of uttar pradesh and many parts of and many other places also uh, post rice uh, before cultivation of wheat, uh, wheat uh, the, the crop residue is burnt and that causes pollution in uh, national capital region so this uh, rice burning uh, um, assessment is carried out the residue burnt area is mapped using uh, eo data this shows how we do drought assessment in kharif season we use various indicators like rainfall deviation dry spell uh, ndvi soil moisture index and uh, sown area from satellite data all these are combined together to give a district or sub district level drought assessment same similarly it is done for rabi season drought assessment where ndvi is also where in rabi season is a very typical situation of drought assessment first the whole state is, country is divided into uh, different cropping situations like northeast monsoon area uh, irrigated area rain fed area ground water or surface irrigated area based on various uh, methodologies various data this uh, country is classified uh, into different cropping situations for each cropping situation there are different indicators and and also eo data is one of the indicators the other indicators are soil moisture sown area um, uh, ground water um, uh, drought index all these are combined together this is first time 
in 2020, to, uh, 20, uh, we did the uh, Rabi season drought assessment. All these drought assessment helps the states for drought declaration and finally helps the uh, states to get um, funds uh, from National Disaster Fund um, um, uh, from the central government for pro providing help or providing um, uh, support to the farmers who have lost crops uh, um, because of the drought. This shows uh, um, uh, our um, uh, MNCFC's assessment drought frequency map and the state government's drought frequency map. The colors are different because we have we have only six years, uh, seven, uh, seven years data, but then we have used the state government's um, um, in 19, 20 years data. But you can see the typical drought, uh, major drought affected areas, which has been assessed using satellite data and other in, uh, technology based parameters are similar both for uh, state drought declaration and our assessment using technology. We have a drought portal where we upload various drought indices, uh, NDVIs, NDWIs, this is this up, uh, uploaded in um, using um, uh, both uh, at district level and sub-district level. And even I would uh, like if any student is uh, hearing this lecture, of, uh, they can use this data, they can use this data for their own research work. Uh, this data you can go to our website and you can download in excel files you can see the graphs you can see uh, um, and uh, and get this data there is no need of uh, taking any approval you can always use this data this typically shows uh, you know uh, into 2000 uh, um, uh, early 2020 there was low cost attack in um, in rajasthan so we have tried to use high resolution data pre attack and post attack data to assess uh, the uh, low cost damage. All these blue areas are um, um, uh, crops, uh, the fields where locusts have affected, locusts have eaten away the crops. Same thing uh, during May, uh, uh, during May also there was a locust attack in Jaisalmer and Barma. We used high resolution data to identify the locust damage area. This is the study of rice residue burning. Uh, you know, uh, say your satellite data, your data is used, especially the thermal data is used to identify the burning locations. And also uh, satellite data can be used for crop area assessment and crop, uh, um, uh, crop production assessment. So that can be compared with the burning areas. And this data also can be used for, um, em and along with emission factors can be used to identify, to, to assess the pollution uh, potential. So this, uh, uh, this we regularly monitor uh, using uh, using uh, um, um, the data set uh, available, uh, uh, international data set available. We also uh, try to find out the NDVI profile uh, of um, uh, rice and wheat crop prior to 2009. You know, 2009, um, uh, the uh, governments of Haryana, Punjab uh, passed the order where the, the um, because, to save groundwater. Uh, or the big, to save the areas, the groundwater depletion, they passed the order for delaying the rice crop uh, plantation. And that's why you can see in this particular case, Punjab or Haryana, the duration between rice and wheat have reduced. Um, 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 uh, and all that, that has caused farmers to grow more uh, to, to uh, do, because there is a very low, less period and now days we are using combine for harvesting, so it leaves a, 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 a tall residue. So they, 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 they find it easy to burn the residue. So this basically shows uh, there was a big period which have, after this 2009, this has, the period has reduced between the rice harvesting and wheat growing. Well, your data is also used, uh, satellite data is also used for various applications in crop insurance. Pro in crop insurance, uh, we have a uh, major flagship program called Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, which mandates the use of technology for your imp uh, implementation. You can see uh, Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana had multiple guidelines. The first guideline came in 2016, then revised guideline came in 2018. And revamp guideline came in 2020. You can see the remote sensing term. The first guideline had five times remote sensing term, and now it is 42 times it remote sensing. So this shows how uh, satellite remote sensing or your data has got into the PMA Bay program. How it has been kind of internalized in the PMA Bay program. 
the various uh, uh, applications of uh, your data in, um, uh, in, in crop insurance is to check the area discrepancy. What do I, what I mean by area discrepancy is when there is a difference between insured area and actual zone area, to take those uh, differences, satellite data is used. So uh, under FASAL, we are giving district level estimates, but for uh, this checking area discrepancy, we get block level estimates for 5,480 blocks. We get the block level estimates. And the crop yield also, um, uh, satellite data is used for crop yield estimation. Uh, various aspects of crop yield, like yield quality checking, smart sampling, I'll talk about smart sampling, yield dispute resolution, two-step yield estimation, direct yield estimation. I'll, I'll talk about this in my subsequent slides. It's also used for loss assessment. I have shown you some of the uh, qualitative loss assessment studies like uh, for drought loss assessment, uh, for uh, health term, for pest and disease. Also for clustering of districts based on risk because in uh, crop insurance, the insurance companies um, um, uh, take, uh, bid for a group of districts which are, which are a book of districts which has got high risk, low risk combination. So to cluster those districts, we use long-term satellite data uh, to find out the risk potentials of different districts. This is a typical case. In, whenever there is a uh, dispute between uh, uh, insurance company and the state government related to crop yield, you know, the PMFBI is an yield-based insurance. So yield is the uh, fact, yield is the index based on which the insurance claim is given, and yield is uh, derived using crop cutting experiments. And if there is a uh, there is a dispute between the state government and insurance companies, and the dispute can't be resolved uh, uh, by either state level or national level, so they they you they uh, ask us to uh, um, solve these disputes using uh, satellite data and agrometric models. So we use those more, more estimate, you use agrometric models and uh, remote sensing based models to resolve those disputes. So till now we have um, uh, uh, resolved in 5,130 insurance units. We have resolved the disputes and more than 2,000 crore of uh, insurance claims have been given uh, based on your based assessments. The, of course, as, you, I, as I told the crop, yield is assessed using crop cutting experiments. And, uh, but there are a lot of issues in crop cutting experiments, especially there is a large number of crop cutting experiments need to be carried out. And the duration for which the crop cutting experiment is carried out very low because there is a short harvest period. So since the duration is low and number is very high, it, is, it happens many times that uh, the rigor with which the CC should be done is not done. So there is a biased uh, um, estimates. So government of India proposes to uh, use technology driven crop yield estimation. There are three approaches for that. One is smart sampling, where the crop cutting experiment location is decided based on the satellite and weather derived proxy yield map. The second one is two step yield estimation, where the first the technology or satellite data or other weather data is used to characterize a loss. And only if loss is severe and moderate, then large number of CCs are conducted. If loss is low, then um, um, less number of CCs are conducted. And finally, we are trying, we are doing large number of pilot studies to directly estimate yield uh, from the from satellite, AI, UAV, IoT, and model. Uh, all kinds of um, um, uh, technology are using for a direct yield estimation at GP level. So this is uh, an example of crops, uh, smart sampling under PMFBI. We are using a satellite data for generating a crop map, the transplanting debt map. Then we use various types of information uh, like uh, um, uh, insulation, FAPR, the reflectors, the uh, land surface wetness index, then NDVI crop and also weather data and uh, har harvest investment of ground data, all these are together combined through a semi-physical model to get a proxy yield. This proxy yield used to make a yield strata at block level and within that strata, within each stratum, randomly points are selected. So this kind of plan is more representative of the, um, uh, of the real crop situation <coughs> and the crop cutting experiments are conducted based on the plans which we give. So till now, we have given around, uh, in last three processes, we have given around 9 lakh points 
uh, for conducting more than 3 lakh cc's uh, using the smart sampling approach. We are also, as I mentioned, we have doing a, uh, using large number of technologies for gram panchayat level yield estimation. So in uh, 2000, we are uh, uh, engaging many agencies, both private and uh, government, both uh, uh, national and inter international agencies. We engaged 13 agencies in 64 districts of 15 states for nine crops during Kharif 2019 for doing, for evaluating the various technologies uh, for uh, crop yield estimation. And since this, there are very encouraging results, we also, we now have large scaled it. So currently, uh, in last Kharif season, well, the, this uh, Kharif season which concluded, we did uh, uh, for 100 districts, we did pilot studies for uh, rice crop by seven agencies. And for in, in, in Rabi, this Rabi, we are also doing pilot for another 100 districts by those seven agencies. So there are very large pilot studies and we have a uh, government of India has a, in next two to three years, government of India uh, uh, tra um, proposes to migrate to technology-based yield estimation. So these pilot studies are going to make a big change in the country uh, uh, about the way um, crop yield is estimated. You can see the various technologies are be being used uh, by different uh, uh, agencies like IFPRI is using Picture-based international food policy research institute is doing picture-based analysis. There's a company called WRSM. They are using a lot of IoT data. Uh, Cropin is another company which is using a, a platform, a very comprehensive platform. So all kinds of technologies are bang, being used for uh, gram panchayat level yield estimation, direct yield estimation. I have, in the in the beginning, I had told the cropping intensity of India is low, especially in Eastern Indian part, and so uh, government of India uh, to improve the food security uh, and also to improve the farmers' income. Government of India proposes to grow uh, the those areas which remain fallow um, uh, after rice crop. Uh, proposes to grow pulses and oil seeds uh, in those areas. So we, we use satellite data. We did this study for um, uh, six states, Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha, and West Bengal. So we use, uh, we use satellite microwave data for rice mapping and optical data for crop and rice, rabi crop and fellow area mapping. And then various agrophysical parameters were used for uh, suitability analysis. This has been done at uh, uh, district level, uh, block level, gram panchayat level. And all these maps have been given to the state governments they are using this for find uh, de for deciding the targets. Government of India has a program called targeting uh, rice fall areas. So those targets are decided based on this kind of maps generated from EO data. It, it also, they were, um, there was a need to to improve the crop intensity. You know, we have a season called jet season uh, between Kharif and Rabi, the two to three months period of summer period. So those are the jet period and many, many areas remain vacant or fellow during that period. So we try to do jet mapping using EO data and also used various, various parameters like growing degree days, mean temperature, water waste indices, normalized different water index and to generate the crop suitability map in, in jet season. So this shows the crop suitability map for um, uh, for Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. So practically, these uh, um, uh, these uh, kinds of um, assessment, this kind of analysis, this kind of suitability mapping will help to uh, improve the crop intensification and help to improve the food security. You know, uh, in uh, in government of India, as I mentioned, the uh, plan for doubling farmers' income. So they have identified 29 double list districts. The double districts districts are based on the climate vulnerability and poverty. The districts are uh, distributed in Bihar, Gujarat, Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, and Uttarakhand. So we have been given. You know, the, we are using your data to monitor these districts, how and uh, identifying those, and also doing contingency planning. So we uh, used various uh, eo based um, information like uh, the drought assessment from nadams the ndvi the vegetation condition index standardized precipitation index 
and irrigation percentage, all these are soil moisture based on supply data. All these are used to um, <coughs> monitor this district and do contingency planning for this double risk districts. So this is um, uh, this the, the main aim of this program. Uh, main aim of this, this study is to improve the uh, farmers' income. This is one study I wanted to. Uh, I would like to. I think end with this slide. Um, um, how this lockdown? You know, uh, we had a uh, lockdown from uh, 23rd March to uh, end of uh, and also uh, 23rd March to end of May. And uh, um, and during this period, we wanted to see how compared with previous year, pre-lockdown, during lockdown, and post-lockdown, um, whether how how the um, crop condition was uh, there compared to 2019. You know, 2019 was a good year, but we found uh, the, during the lockdown period, that is during the summer season. Uh, the um, uh, the crop situation was better uh, than um, than the previous year. This may be also because there are two major reasons for this. One is uh, post uh, after implementation after the uh, 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 imposition of lockdown, government of India made all agriculture operations uh, open and free, so that um, any there is no difficulty in agriculture operations. There are two operations were to be conducted during that period: harvesting of ravi crops and sowing of jade crops. So, and also there are this year there was uh, in 2020 there was very good rainfall compared to last previous year. So we found that even with lockdown, because of these two reasons, the government of India's um, emphasis on making these operations um, um, uh, without without any dis uh, disruption in operations and also the rainfall. So the, the lockdown the lockdown didn't affect the agriculture. Rather, we had a better agriculture both uh, uh, um, in during lockdown and post lockdown. We had a better agriculture compared to uh, last year. This has been done. This this comparison has been made using Indian satellite data, resource to AWIPS uh, data. So overall, uh, I have shown you various examples of how your data is used. Uh, for uh, the food security applications, where agriculture applications, not only in India globally, but we we propose to now. Uh, currently, we are doing uh, around uh, 18 to 19 crops, but we want to increase the more number of crops because uh, um, they, because the crop estimates are very essential for uh, various decision making planning purposes. So both for agriculture and uh, horticulture, we want to increase the number of crops. Better yield forecast, considering both biotic and abiotic factors. Infusing higher technology, you have already seen large amount of large advanced technology, large number of types of advanced technology are being used through pilot studies in crop insurance program. So we are trying to infuse more and more technology to the PMFBI program. Improving drought indices, so working towards a composite drought index. Sustainable agriculture development, uh, some studies have shown crop intensification. We had done earlier studies on cropping system analysis, precision farming. So, uh, you, you know, uh, now because of the uh, uh, very uh, uh, good availability of UAV um, uh, facilities, so precision farming can really make a big change in agriculture, make agriculture from subsistence agriculture to more uh, of a profit oriented agriculture. So we are working towards precision farming. Proposed to have a versatile geoportal of agriculture, which can provide real-time information to farmers about the crop situation from the EO data. Uh, also, the um, uh, need, we need to work on understanding the issues related to agriculture, which is pollution and climate change. Some studies I've shown already the residue burning, but we need to do four and more, more and more studies related to pollution and climate change. And for all these study, all these applications, all these studies, all these implementations, uh, EO data, Indian EO data, or international EO data are going to play a major role along with various advanced technologies, which I'm also to show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray. That's a great talk. Thank you so much. We have some questions in the chat. Uh, are you with, can you take them now? Yes, Let's yes. Read them. 
Yeah, so uh, Gurudatta is asking, how are the private agencies contributing towards the earth observations based assessments of crops? And uh, a second question from him, uh, is NCFC using the niche areas machine learning, computer vision for assessment of crops? Okay. Coming to the private companies, as I have shown you, we have engaged the, because of uh, the availability of free satellite data, especially Sentinel and such, and also uh, you know uh, uh, um, the and because of the emphasis on privatization of various uh, space uh, sec sector space segments, so there are a large number of uh, uh, you know, startups and private companies who are doing really good work. And we have, as you can see, we have engaged many private agencies who are doing crop area estimation, yield estimation uh, at, uh, at, at, um, at the village level or real. And also no, not only they are working for us, they are working for insurance companies, they're working for international bodies. So we have, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll uh, um, uh, let you know that People who are coming from various top institutes, top engineering institutes, top remote sensing institutes, like people coming from IITs, coming from MITs, people coming, but working for agriculture. That's a very, very good, uh, sometimes I being an agriculture person, um, um, uh, um, uh, studied agriculture, I feel very good when people from various branches are coming and working for agriculture. So uh, that I've already shown some examples of blah. So, I rec and not only in India, large number of private companies, large number of private entrepreneurs from international, from Russia, from America, from um, Europe, they're coming and working for India. Because, you know, we have such a diverse cropping situation, such a uh, diverse, uh, our, uh, our problems are so uh, typical. So, if we can solve Indian situation, we can solve anywhere in the world. So, there's a lot of uh, organizations are coming and working for. Uh, uh, for India, I have shown you the examples of IFRI, ICRISAT, all these international agencies, they are working for India. Coming to uh, machine learning algorithms, yes, we are using, we are slowly, slowly uh, getting into machine learning algorithms. Um, uh, like we are we are uh, using you know, um, neural network, support vector machines, random forest approaches for area estimation and yield estimation. I would not say that we have completely shifted to machine learning algorithms, but we are slowly, slowly um, engaging more and more machine learning algorithms for doing crop area and yield assessment. That's pretty good. Actually, the application of using uh, satellite imaging for insurance is something that I heard for the first time, and it's actually pretty good to know that, you know, of the diverse applications uh, that. Uh, EO is used for uh, you know, uh, agriculture. Okay, so the next question Nagajyoti has is on how the locust affected area map is used. Is it by LWO or by co uh, crop insurance companies? So this, uh, see, basically, you know, um, uh, we, have a, we have a locust warning, of, uh, the RRS, Nagajyoti, uh, Mr. Nagajyoti is from RRS. RRC Jodhpur does locust warning. Of course, they have an intercenter committee, and our center is also a member of that committee. They do locust warning. But for our ministry, we try to do to assess the areas for, for where the locust has been. This is an initial study done. So we, we share the results with the ministry to know how much area has been uh, really impacted. You can, if you see, so there are very typical, you must have seen, there are very typical signatures. You will see. If a field has been uh, half affected by signature, by, by locust, the uh, half of the field will look red and the rest half will totally look blank. And the previous image, you'll see the full image is, full field is red. And suddenly you'll see as if someone has caught it, someone has just harvested the half of the field. So those are very easy to identify only if you go to very high resolution data. So we try to identify and share with the ministry. And thank you, ma'am. Actually, I will let me tell you, um, crop insurance is actually one of the major drivers for now spay, uh, EO program. We, we and uh, I will tell you, our uh, our center is highly involved. In fact, our major time goes in providing inputs for the crop insurance program. 
because uh, many uh, disputes, many uh, uh, many issues, many discrepancies can't be resolved unless we use satellite data. So it's, okay. it's nowadays, it's occupying our major uh, um, time, major workforce uh, for, for providing your inputs to crop insurance program. Right. I guess it involves a lot of money as well. So it, yeah, it involves money. Sir. That's why you have to be very careful in giving that. Careful it involves money target. because, uh, but uh, since we are an independent institute, neither uh, like uh, um, neither we are in uh, part of the state government nor we are part of the um, insurance company. So that's, so that's why all these disputes come to us and we resolve and whatever, I'm very happy that whatever estimates we have given um, and that, 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 that have been used by the state governments for, um, uh, for providing insurance claims. Right. Uh, uh, there is uh, Moibon Gabisa who has stopped to say hello. Uh, uh, Moibon is from uh, Ethiopia Geospatial Information Institute and is a, a remote sensing expert as well. So, uh, if Moibon wants to speak, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, I'll move on to the next question. Meanwhile, uh, Mr. Prakash has asked, what are the precision agricultural uh, practices in India with respect to EO data? What are the? Uh, what are the precision agricultural practices in India with respect to EO data? So there are uh, various applications of EO data and precision agriculture. There are two. Uh, we generally they use two types. One is you use uh, high resolution data for um, uh, creating, for, uh, for uh, mapping the variability, both temporal and spatial variability. And uh, there are also, you, people use hyperspectral data to uh, um, uh, assess the crop situation, crop nutrient stress, water stress, all, the, um, all these aspects. Uh, but I would not say that it's a very large scale operational applications. One major problem has been because of the uh, low field size of India. Um, uh, so people, especially individual farmers, know very much about this farm. farm. But uh, many, many, uh, many, uh, um, like, like grape farms. We have done work on grape farms or large farms in Punjab where precision agriculture is, 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 can be used. But we are slowly getting into that. I would, uh, there are also UAVs are being used for prison agriculture. Um, uh, the UAV because it gives a very high resolution data, prison agriculture is, it is being used. But most of these are still at R&D level. Most of these are still at pilot study level. The large scale prison agriculture, I think will going to come. Uh, Government of India is, Ministry of Agriculture is bring, trying to, um, bring out a mission called National Digital Agriculture Mission. Once that is approved, once that is done, so we are going to have a, uh, we are going to have more emphasis on prison agriculture. Right, so uh, the, going by your point on the field size, so uh, does it matter? Uh, so if you have a highly fragmented uh, field, versus, uh, you know, the large fields owned by larger corporations or state owned. Uh, do you feel that the, uh, the kind of uh, earth observations that are done have to be done differently, uh, depending on the field size? See, in your, when you use your remote sensing data, you have a kind of a, uh, something we call it synthetic field size. Even if field size is small, if a large, uh, continuous, uh, multiple fields are growing same crop, so it, they, 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 then uh, high resolution, low resolution data also can is suffice. But okay. if every individual field, like if you go to, uh, you are in Karnataka, if you go to Dharwad or Gadag, every field has a different crop. So there okay. you need very high resolution data. Those fields mm -hmm. are difficult. Those areas are difficult. But if you have a continuous, especially rainfed areas where crop diversity is very high, if every field is a separate crop, then you need a high resolution data. You need uh, uh, really very high amount of ground truth. You need sometimes you need UAV data for do those assessments. So, but if there is a contiguous synthetic field size, rice, though field sizes like in Odisha, if you, though field sizes are very small, 
but there is continuous rise so you don't have any problem so th that's because the synthetic field size is very large okay so uh, the other thing is uh, where do you use uav where do you decide where uav uav because drone technology is uh, growing big now uh, so where would that play a role versus satellite i mean i'm guessing they are not substitutable yeah right? you have so, rightly guessed they are not the substitute they are complementary see yeah, yeah. there are positive and negative aspects of both see mm -hmm. in satellite data can give you a very large area coverage but satellite mm -hmm. data is also uh, not exactly ages and where is condition like you can't you can't get the day i want only when that satellite passes that area then you can get like as i was saying the repetitivity so you can't get exactly that day and also a major problem is satellite as the, the cloud cover problem so you can't get data but uav you can because you are uav you are using in 200 feet uh, height or the, those about uh, around similar height then you can you can get data any day any time but the coverage is like suppose you are flying uav uh, maximum in one day you can cover 10 square kilometer but in uh, some few seconds or micro uh, seconds you can get uh, large uh, 70 kilometer by 70 kilometer data uh, in from satellite so that is uh, why uh, uh, uavs can't replace Uh, satellites but you need to com complement you need to complement suppose there is very small area and uh, and there is a loss suppose there is hailstorm attack so if you have to do a small area assessment localized uh, losses you want to do a small area assessment uav are useful and also uav you can use as a ground truth for uh, for improving satellite behavior. like let's you would do our satellite uh, image analysis you have a, either you can do a smartphone based ground truth there you can cover only one two fields but you can use a uav data to more do a um, ground truth uh, for a large area 10 square kilometer area and get and second uh, another problem with uav is uh, you is uh, costly see per hectare on an average uav cost as 100 rupees but if you take list 3 list 4 data Five meter data, then uh, the even forget of list four is a very Indian data, cheap cheap data. If I take planet data per square kilometer, if a large area data I take is fifty rupees per square kilometer. That is hundred hectare is fifty rupees, and in UAB will be one hectare hundred rupees. So the cost is very high. The third problem of UAB is there is large approval required, very strong approval. recently government of, um, um, department of the director general of uh, civil aviation or ministry of civil aviation has given us uh, the ministry of agriculture a uh, conditional approval of uh, 100 districts flying uavs for this pmfbi but still uh, that has lot of uh, conditions attached to that you have to get approval of the ministry of defense you have to get the approval of ministry of home affairs so those approval takes so much of time uh that uh, finally the crop season gets over so there were the issues available but still uav is becoming a big uh, um, um, like it's coming very big way and not only to, um, for crop assessment lot of uh, um, i i have i've seen in you uh, have a program called rkvi rashtriya krishi vikas yojana under that uh, the state government submit projects for the, the new technologies lot of uh, project proposals are coming for uav based fertilizer application pesticide application that's also a coming a big way that's interesting i guess there's a whole entrepreneurial uh, push to the uh, uav technology as well right uh, yeah so talking of uh, regulations uh, gurudatta has an excellent question here gurudatta would you like to unmute and speak Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Doctor Ray. It was a very insightful presentation, sir. Thanks a lot for uh, your time in uh, giving this talk. Uh, my basic question is: Now, recently, we saw Government of India has made some uh, geospatial policy-related announcement where a uh, lot of uh, uh, what do you say? A lot of uh, uh, silo kind of uh, management of data has been sort of. Uh, Uh, taken off and uh, more openness uh, in access of data has been uh, provided so how do you see this uh, in the years ahead uh, for uh, earth observation in particular related to crop uh, analysis and assessment 
it's, 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 it's see, basically it's going to be a re really very useful because many data, especially high resolution data, um, we being in a government agency, okay, we are able to get, but the, for access to the private companies were difficult. Uh, and uh, we feel it's the country is so large. Uh, so there, there is a need of, you know, even, even uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister also has in many, multiple addresses has told this, that uh, uh, we need to, uh, uh, all, all problems can be solved by the government sector. All issues can be solved by the government sector. When you have to do, uh, deal with large areas, large 147 um, uh, million uh, uh, land holdings, so you have to have all kinds of agencies together. You have to work together. Uh, there is need of public-private partnership. So when this kind of, um, but when the, the major issue becomes when public-private partnership, the data sharing, the data, because high resolution data has its own problem, one security issues. But I think with this kind of a new special, uh, uh, new special policy, um, public partner, private partnership will be uh, will be uh, get a boost. And uh, you, why in agriculture especially? Because we have very small field sizes, so high resolution data is highly essential. So when, when if there is uh, uh, limitations are um, this uh, uh, limitations are uh, reduced, so it will really give a big boost to agriculture. Because I think. One of the major applications uh, where high resolution data is uh, needed is agriculture, especially in, in India. So I am I'm very much uh, 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 very much hopeful for this new geospatial policy. Thank you, sir. Yes, we are all in favor of this new uh, openness in the you know sharing yeah. of geospatial data. Uh, I remember okay, in so long back uh, we were. Uh, if you have to use a survey of India, then only class one officer can issue a survey of India map. And right. th those times where the Google Earth was not there or, um, or digital maps are not there. So you have to use a survey of India map where we are issuing only a class one officer can sign and issue a uh, survey of India map, restricted map. So those, I think uh, we have come a long way uh, from those days. And further with this new policy, we can go further. Definitely, sir. Yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Ray. I think uh, we have no more questions here. So we will, uh, we can close the talk. Uh, it's been a really exciting talk, sir, and very in insightful as well as Gurudas has just mentioned. It's, it's been great. Um, I Guru uh, Nagjoti, if you would like to say a word or two. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sibanda. Thank you. Thank you <laughs> so much. Uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I think a lot of things you have covered, uh, especially in, in terms of crop insurance. Uh, I think it is an uh, enlightenment to all of us. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. And you know. Uh, thank you. Thank you. The whole of uh, IEEE GRSS uh, Bangalore chapter, uh, for who, all people of Bengal chapter, for giving me this opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs>